So you're gonna get the word. Right, so thank you very much. So now anybody who has any questions, right? So I guess there is a lot of things to ask. Can you ask John, please? Yeah, John, you're gonna be the next person actually, get prepared. <laughs> oh, um so when it comes to producers and songwriters, yep. um so they might have an agent who gives them work. So they say, you know, this art artist is looking for a song, so produce songs and write songs for this artist from this label. Is that how it works? Is that all legit? Um, basically, it's a form of management. I mean, manage, I manage producers as well. <clears throat> so obviously, we try and get them work. We try and get them remixes. We try and, if they're songwriters, we try and get their songs done with. You know, I manage a couple of DJs. A guy called David Noakes. He's got a track out at the moment with the front runners called um, uh, Black Sunflowers, and um, he's co-written that with them. They're signed to Notting Hill. Um, there's a couple of labels interesting at the moment. So then we're then getting Dave remix work at the moment. Um, so that's, that would be a management role of, of getting a... If you're a, so, a producer songwriter, yeah. then get some management. So basically, as a producer, that's all I would need to look for. It's a manager. Yeah, because an agent, I mean, if you're not going to go out live, if you're not a DJ or whatever, because obviously the, the, you can have a multifaceted thing. We, we, one of our DJs, she, she's a singer, dancer, performer, and she's a producer and a songwriter. Um, I taught her all she knows. Actually, I didn't. Um, but um, yeah, all you need is, is, is basically um, a, a, a management. So uh, sign to it, you know, get someone who, who's into what you're doing, who believes in your songwriting, whatever. Well, I kind of have that, but how would I stand out? Because there's loads of people. You kind of have that. Uh, well, what do you know? What well, you don't know, you don't remember. <laughs> What'd you get for Christmas? I mean, I do have that, but I don't know why I just have a lot of doubt because how would I stand out because there's so many people pitching songs well the obvious answer is to go and see your manager and go what the fuck's going on no I mean like basically I just met him recently and he was like you know these artists need songs right and I was like okay cool but maybe it's just an insecurity thing with me I'm thinking there's so many people pitching songs so how would I stand yeah, but out if you don't pitch you're not going to be in there right? you've got to be in it to win it so ultimately if someone say, if, I say to an, if I say to a writer right you know Fred Bloggs wants songs, and they go, yeah, but everyone's going to be pitching. I'm going to go, see you later. <laughs> Fuck off. I ain't got time for it. If you're not, if you don't, you know, it doesn't matter if 20,000 people are putting their songs in. What the hell difference does it make? If they say yes, great, you've got a deal. If they say no, give it to someone else. If they say no, give it to someone else. So you know of an artist, an artist could, you know, have a big fan base and impress a manager, and a manager will be like, this artist is great, they have a lot of followings and all that. But for a producer, it's just a great song. That's all they have to... Catch attention. Unless you're basically. the songwriter. So, what you produce and a songwriter? Yeah. Well, that I, sounds I, I, so dismissive. That's quite a big deal. You're a producer and a songwriter? Yeah. Right, so. There are you, going to be a million and one people who kind of like, I hate using this term, haters. Don't self hate on yourself. You may as well big yourself up. Stop this doubting stuff. That's what I'm saying. You've got, you, you know, if you don't push yourself, it's what I've been talking about. If you don't push yourself, who the fuck cares? I don't care. If, you, if you're. If you're going to sit, if I was managing you, you go, yeah, but they might not like it. Well, fuck off, don't do it then. Go and work in fucking Tesco's or something, you know? What's the point? If, if you've got a talent, I mean, I wish I was talented. I wish I could write songs. I wish I could fucking play a guitar, right? I can't even fart in tune. So why you're sat there when you can produce and write and you're saying, yeah, but he's asking me to submit this, but other people are going to do it. Well, sorry, but that's the, that's the nature of every business, you know? I mean, those headphones, you know, what are they, Sony? Yes. Well, you know, everyone's after the headphone market, so you could have had Beats, which are shit headphones, but the branding's brilliant, right? But, you know, if you're not trying, well, what the fuck am I gonna try? Simple. You know, use your talent. Make the most of what you got. If it turns out it's shit, fine, then he should be telling you it's shit, right? Yeah. If he's your mate, sorry, you husband, mate, mate. part? Mate, mate. all right, sorry. <laughs> And our cheap jewellers around the corner are interested. Um, but you should, you know, if her stuff's shit, tell her it's shit. That's the reality. But, you know, you can, all you can do is work at it, and then you should be working yourself up as a songwriter and producer on the social stuff, right? So if your stuff's appealing to Wiley or Skepta or, you know, whoever, start whacking them some tunes up, little links. All right, they're probably going to ignore it. We know that. But what's it take? It's not costing you, is it? All it's costing you is your time. If you can't put your time into it, don't fucking do it. Simple. Okay. Well, you just got something to say on that. So what I realise that most musicians, the problem is that 
they don't realize that after they're done from the dark room with their piano, like composing the song and being lost in their own world, once you want to make money out of it and want, you want people to listen to it, this becomes a product. So it's, it's part of the market. Now, if you, if you don't feel comfortable taking this out or talking with professionals to put it in the market, then probably just keep it for yourself and to your mom and stuff like that. So you, I, I, I think there's the problem. Every artist is very romantic about it, right? So you just start, start using the word product. So music yeah, you is product be realistic. in the market. It's, what are you doing it for? It's true of anyone who's creative because it's their baby. But exactly. This is why it's different. This is another com conversation. But yeah, it's your baby. But yeah, just be less romantic. Be more cynical, just like the gentleman over there. I'm not cynical. I'm passionate. I don't like, I don't like people wasting talent. And I think, you know, don't, don't get started on the, uh, the monetization side of it at the moment because that's a whole new story. But... You know, I believe music has an inherent value, and I think it's being undervalued at the moment. And I, and I think, you know, it pisses me off that as a band, you can go and earn 20 pound at a pub and, you know, hopefully 50 people will turn up. But as a DJ, you can go and earn 10 grand playing those same tracks that those poor bastards have recorded. But that's the weird world we live in, you know. And I, you know, I manage some DJs, so I, you know, obviously if, I, if they get 10 grand a gig, I'm happy. But the, the, the fact is that the devaluation of the whole <coughs> music scene you know, I find, I find really distressing, not purely in monetary terms, but it's kind of like people are trying to make it as though it's worthless, right? Well, to me, music is all about passion. And music, that sounds really corny, but everyone's got something that's a soundtrack to their life. Someone's got a tune that it could be, you know, your first shag, it could be your divorce, it could be your wedding, it could be your engagement, it could be, you know, whatever. There's always a song to go with an occasion. What, what other thing can do that? You know, I studied history of art as A-level, but, you know, and I, I'm touched by paintings. I love them. You know, I love Monet, I love Manet. All the impressionists, fantastic, right? But I can't take that with me. I, I could have a little book or have a Van Gogh download on my phone, but it takes like, about 40 fucking gig. Um, but, you know, it's not the same. It's not the same emotion. You know, music can make you high, music can make you low. Music can make you dance. Well, with me, I have to be seriously pissed to do that, but, but you take my point, right? Um, and, and so, you know, now music's more important than ever. If you, if you walk down a street, if you go back five years, you would never see any bastards walking around with headphones on, other than like a Sony Walkman or something, right? Now, it's almost who isn't wearing headphones, right? But, but we're, we're being told as an industry, and this is nothing to do with major or anyone, we're being told as an industry it's worthless, right? And, and I said to Tommy the other day, you know, you go in Starbucks, you're paying three pounds for a cup of coffee. I love it. I'm not knocking Starbucks, got no problem with our tax affairs, don't matter. It's a nice cup of coffee. So I, I personally don't give a toss, right? Uh, and it still makes me laugh, people Googling information on Starbucks when Google are actually worse than Starbucks. But just call me old-fashioned. But you go in Starbucks, and at the end of the counter, there's a free thing. There's a free, seed, you know, free download of a book or a, a, an app. Do you know what? People don't even pick it up. And this constant deluge of free this, free that, free that, you've got to make it work for you. you know? It's like, if you're going to give something free, make sure you've got an email address out of it. Don't give an album away, for fuck's sake. Give, a single, give one track away. If people are vibing into that, they might buy into other stuff. I had an act come into me, they'd done 12 track album free. So I said, what, what heat did you generate from that? They said, oh, we had over a thousand people downloaded it. I said, right. They said, and what we're doing, we're going to do, an, we've done another one, it's an EP, 14 tracks. I said, well, for a start off, an EP ain't 14 tracks, it's almost a double <laughs> album. So I had a 20 minute conversation about what an EP meant. Um, God knows what they thought an album meant, 14 tracks is an EP. <laughs> And, and they're, they're, the whole plot, and these were two kids with no money, you know, and they blagged studio time and blagged mates as musos and stuff. And they're, their fantastic idea was, we're going to give that away free. And I said, well, what are you going to generate from that? And they said, well, we might get more people downloading it. And I went, all right, so say 2,000 people download it this time. Right? You've now given away 26 songs. Where is there a value in any of your catalogue? You ain't going to get a publishing deal because you're giving away for, for nothing. <laughs> There's no accounting for it. No record label is going to give you a deal. You've got 26 free tracks out there. Oh, is that a problem? Should we cut it down to 10? It's like, you know, it, and, and so that, that kind of, the whole devaluation thing, but obviously I said it's another story. Sorry. I, I'd get sidetracked easily. <laughs> it's, it's all good. It's interesting stuff. Um, it just to answer, I feel like with the whole it's their baby thing, every baby does have to leave the nest eventually. And I think that that's an important part for artists to take into account as well, is that we have to let it go and it has to exist in the real world at some point. Um, and then I have a question for you. I saw something you had up there was never buy 
likes or whatever or, or anything like that. Now that's a question that I've recently been experimenting with as something that I thought was a terrible thing until someone who's a fan of mine and has been for about a year and a half and when I released my new EP we started, he's, he's always supports, he always writes to me and says what he thinks of my songs and, and eventually I just went and checked out his website and he offers this like I'll get you Twitter likes, right? So, so I asked him about it, I said what is it that you do and how do you do it? And he says basically you tell me say five to ten artists who are in a similar genre to you, to you who are successful. So in my case, I could say Coldplay, Jack Johnson, um, etc. And then he goes and strategically follows certain of their followers on, with my account. But so, so I experimented with it and within the last sort of month and a half I've gained 4,000 followers or whatever. But what's interesting to me is that when I do post now, and I feel like what I'm posting is valuable stuff. I post, um, because my songs are deep, I post a lot of philosophical things. I post about my music, I post jokes. I, and I'm getting a lot more response, like a massive increase. And not only that, but people who are finding me through this connection are starting to buy my album. It's not massive amounts, I'm not a huge artist, but they are doing it. So I'm just wondering, is there a, do you think that in any way that that could be a useful thing? Because I question myself about it daily. Like, I'm like, is, am I just I'm shooting myself in the foot here? Um, Hello, again. Um, what, what he's doing there is uh, gaming Twitter followers, which everyone can do. Uh, don't pay anyone to do it, because it's so easy to do. Um, where, <clears throat> yeah, essentially, uh, there's a lot of tools out there on Twitter, just as, as an example, where... Um, you can kind of trick, I say trick people, it's the wrong word, but it is in a way. You can get people to follow you quite easily. When I hear all the time, because I work in the social media industry, that's how I know Ian, but uh, I hear it all the time. Um, and it's so easy where people go, oh, I need followers. You don't need followers. You don't, actually. But if you want them, they're really easy to get. Um, and there's software out there. TweetAd is a good one. Um, oh, what's the other one? There's another, uh, TweetAd is just a basically a good one to use, where you can actually just, you can, you're right. All it is is they'll go and follow. They'll look at Coldplay's followers. Um, it will take about three or four minutes, have a little look through, and they'll follow them on your behalf. And if they don't follow back within, say, seven days, there's, there's software out there that will automatically unfollow them for you. So as you gradually go along, your numbers are going up while your people you follow are around about staying the same. So everyone looks and thinks, wow, you've got loads and loads of followers there. It's just all it is doing, it's all they do is just follow other people on your behalf, which anyone can do, and it takes, honestly, I, I, I do about half an hour a day for my clients, and they're all growing. On that respect, yes. But what I think what it, there's there's two parts to this. Uh, following people, hoping they'll follow you back because they're in similar genre. Yeah, I fine. I do that. You know, in in what I do, um, I do it quite a lot, and it, it it's valuable. And from what you said there, I don't disagree with that at all. I think what Ian's mainly talking about is the fakes. You talk about the fakes, aren't you? Thought, yeah, yeah we, we were on the, overnight. Uh, without naming names, yeah, we, we worked on a, a project where um, a, a, a certain female artist went from 300 Facebook fans to 8,300 Facebook fans overnight. And what they've done is it, you can buy bots that basically are just thousands upon thousands of fake, fake Facebook profiles. They're out on the internet, you can get them for silly money. Um, and they're the ones to avoid, like the plague, and you can get them on Twitter as well, because they won't give a toss about who you are. Yeah, you get your account suspended, Twitter are hard on it. About 8,000, I think 7,000 were in the Philippines. Well, they've, yeah, they've been given, um, I think it's the Philippines, they've been given that's where they're from, but they were fake, none of them were real, um, and you can buy them easily. Because they're just destroying your edge rate. Right? Absolutely, yeah. I had a conversation with someone today about that. They've got 11,000 fans, a particular band, um, and I had a thorough look into it for the first time, I've taken over from someone else, and uh, 9,600 uh, were from Papua New Guinea, uh, registers Papua New Guinea people. They don't exist. Um, I sent them all, a few of them messages to say, I've got about, I've got a couple of uh, hundred quid here if you want it. It's, I've left it on the floor over it. No one even comes back to me and goes, you tosser, who the fuck are you? That's because no. I'm queuing up to use the one computer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again... <laughs> um, but, but again, with, you mentioned EdgeRank, for those that aren't familiar with EdgeRank on Facebook, if you put a post out on Facebook on your page, probably about only 20% of the people actually see it. 
that's just that's what they do. Um, now, if you get loads of fake followers um, and you put something quite important out, that means 20% of those fakes are going to see it, and the real ones, the chances are they're just not going to see it at all. Um, which is why, as Ian's quite rightly said, never don't ever buy fake ones at all, and it's easily out there. But what you were saying is slightly different, where that's called gaming. You're gaming, you're following. And anyone can do it. Don't ever pay anyone to do it, because you can do it yourself. You can do it in half an hour. Um, and it's really easy to do. Um, see me often, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how to do it. It's, it's just seriously so easy to do. Are you going to get quality followers if you do it like that? Uh, well, if you follow the, basically uh, follow the people that you'd like to follow, they follow you. So if you if it's someone that's uh, as chap that's saying you know Coldplay etc. Et um, if you think they're going to be into your music as well, follow their followers. Yeah, absolutely. If they don't follow back or they don't give a toss, fine, unfollow them in a week's time. You know, well, it's easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. Tap into their audience because it only takes. It's a legitimate thing. If you follow, say, a hundred of their followers, and maybe one or two follow back, one of them might be, I think, Christ, you're, you know, you're really good, nice one, I'll tell all my mates about it, I'll retweet, etc. And it, it only takes a little spark. I'll wake them up and tell them about it. I'm not going in that route. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But yeah, no, gaming is, is fine. That's if you, but again, don't pay anyone to do it, seriously, because you can do it yourself, it's so easy to do. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, so what I've realized so far, what we're talking about is that, that real things matter. Everything else that is fake, fake numbers, statistics. Sorry, make her ask a question. <laughs> oh, you want to ask a question? What's <laughs> what do you have in your mind? When dinner time. Oh, dinner time. <laughs> right, so yeah, so I realized that real things matter, right? Professionals, people that know what they do, numbers, statistics, a platform that everybody can use, doesn't really matter. So this is what we're talking about. Like, if you want to forge your personality on the social media, it's not going to work. If you want to get different numbers, like have millions of followers, it's not going to have any return because it's all about sales. It's all about mattering in the market. And the market is real. It's people buying stuff. It's not bots liking and whatever. So yeah, please, question. Obviously, you had, you've explained your history in management and running like independent kind of labels and stuff like that. Obviously, I've been running it independent for a while now and obviously not n relatively large or anything but working with a lot of number of artists and stuff like that so we've gained traction online uh, live shows and stuff like that but obviously most of it has been self-funded and obviously investing 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 so obviously to try and what i've realized is doing it on the as i've been going along basically it's a full-time job to do what you have to do and kind of gain an actual thing going with different artists and stuff like that but um, we've got, and got, kind of got to a point where it's like, okay, I want to do this full time though. I, I do do it full time, but I want to officially full time where it's like, okay, so a lot of it's been, focus has been on revenue and stuff like that. And kind of how I've seen right now how it's going is like, really you've got events and merchandise at the moment that I think I in terms of... Old school of, models, by the way. Yeah, which are old school, exactly. So the acts that are very talented live-wise are kind of thriving a bit in that arena, but it's like... How for how much investment or how in roughly obviously you can't give a rough figure in generally to everyone because the, yeah. the different the situations time. exactly but in rough how much would you say you, you kind of have to invest to a certain point where it's like okay by this amount of investment you should standardly be getting a certain a decent return. Easy to answer, investment. right? You could you could put a million pound in and get fuck all back. Right, literally. You could put a tenner on the table and sell a million albums. It's, it's one of the few industries. It's always a problem when you're doing... When people go, oh, yeah, go to the bank. They give you finance. Yeah. That'd be interesting until you have to do a P&L. What's your projected sales? Fuck knows. I don't know. How many records are you putting out? Well, I'm putting out three singles on an album. How many are you going to sell? I don't know. Might sell none. Might sell 10 million. Might do an Adele. Might sell 35 million, right? There is no answer. That's why... The whole investment thing, with people going, oh, yes, yeah, investors talk to VCs. Forget VCs, they don't give a shit. They want 51% of your company. If they put a million pound on the table, we offer a million pound deal, but it's a million pound in stages. They don't pay anything towards salaries, right? It's purely investment in, in the artistic side. So straight away, the, the answer there is, well, how the fuck am I going to run it if I'm not getting paid, right? And it's a full-time gig. <laughs> so that doesn't work. Banks forget, because they just laugh at you, right? <clears throat> um, 
you, you, you only, the only way of up really to ice it is get investments. If obviously one of the one of the sort of setups like Fusion or, or PRS Fund or whatever, some of them might be interested if you're going with a viable proposition rather than just going, oh no, mate, I want to put a record out. Because it's like, well, that's not really a plot, right? Um, what you're doing sounds like you, you, you're trying to, possibly, possibly you might be trying to do too, too much. much. I don't know how many actually you're working with. Not that many. Um, um, two, three, like four? Three, three. Three, yeah. I mean, that's probably about as much as you want to extend yourself at this time. Um, what I would say is, have you, have you built a brand for the label? Yeah. It's all urban stuff. Not all urban, it's kind of diverse, but... Well, because, that, again, that comes back to the branding issue, right? Because, obviously, on the urban side, you know, you've got your dench and, and all the various nonsense that goes on there, but that's a great income stream because we, we found one of our acts. People won't pay for gigs, they won't pay for records, but they buy a £20 T-shirt that costs us three quid. Right? Go figure. I mean, who not, I don't know, right? Um, admittedly, they're lovely T-shirts and they're quality and, and the, the designs are fantastic. <laughs> But I just find it a slightly ironic that someone won't pay 79 pence for a download, but they give you 20 pounds for a shirt. Fine. Um, so, I, you know, from your point of view, what I would suggest is that you, you kind of ramp up your branding. Obviously, the live side's great if people want to pay you to play, but obviously at the early stages, you're lucky to get on a bill. Right? That's just how it is. You might get a bottle of Budweiser at the end of it, they'll probably charge you for it. Right? But, you know, you, unfortunately, that's how the game is. You, you've got to do that. But... I would have said, uh, without knowing your acts and without knowing exactly the genre you're in, I would have said your best bet is to actually look at the brand inside, make sure you've got a shit hot logo, make sure the logo and, and the brand appeals to each of those acts. It's no good having, if you've got three acts and one's a, one's a hardcore urban act, you know, you know, you've got Conan and Crep there and then you've got Slayer in the middle and it ain't going to work, right? Because you can't mass brand completely different genres. So it, it's just pure marketing, really. You just, you've, you've got to look at where you're going, where, where your main areas of expenditure are, and is it, is it bringing any positives out of it, right? If, you're just, if it's just a big hole, then you've got to re-look at what you're doing and how you're doing it, yeah. right? Because otherwise, it, it, it is literally, you, someone, you could win a lottery now and win 50 mil and spunk it and not sell a record, right? It, you, you cannot put a figure on it. It's like you can never put a time frame in it as well. But, oh, I'm going to have this record out in February. Well, have you put all the stuff in position to get it to that point to release it, you know? So it's, it's all about planning and, and, and looking at where you're at. And I would have said, not hearing your stuff, but if you're already doing merch, Ramp it up, ramp up. You make sure you, it's, make sure it's a real good look for the market. I mean, you might have already done that, right? But, but I would have said concentrate on that, you know, and, and talk to people at Rewind, send them a couple of free shirts or whatever if it's the applicable market. I don't know. It's hard to tell because yeah. I don't know the genre in it, right? But, but push that angle, right? Because what you'll end up doing, you'll be chasing your tail all the time because you're running around there. He's got a gig there. He's got a gig there. Every time you go to a gig, it's going to cost you in petrol, par parking, buying the artist a burger and a, you know, Coke or whatever it is, you know, you probably end up losing £50 pound a night, right? That can only go on for so long. <laughs> so you've got to look at ways where at least you can stop the hemorrhaging. My thing is if you put a record out and you can break even, you've got a result, right? If you make a profit, like, go and do a fucking dance down the high street, right? But <laughs> if, if you can break even, you've come out, you've won, right? You've seriously won because you've laid a foundation, you've put a thing in place, and people next time, there'll be more people buying into it. And it, it is the old corny thing. You lay down a building blocks, you put a foundation down, you've got a much, more, much be better chance of building the house on it and stays firm. And you can build on that and develop it. Just to add on lastly, so I don't use up the time and everything, but um, what are the, in terms of, obviously, I'm not trying to chase a deal with everything. Like, you know, it's still independent. If you get to like, people like Macklemore who just do independent all the way and everything yeah, like that. That's fine when you've got this money coming in. Yeah, exactly. And again, it's a bigger market. You see, the States, you know, it's always been the same. You could have a record in New York and sell 50,000 vinyl. Yeah. So you didn't need a deal. So, so what, are the, like, what are the figures in terms of, what's the average benchmark of when uh, you have like certain labels, I like, say, I don't know, you mentioned Crept and Conan, they just did like a virgin deal. Yeah, just before And Christmas. it's like, um, what's the figures or the benchmarks where they look and say, you know, I'm, we want to sink our teeth into that. In honesty, in honesty it's, um, uh, it's down to the whim of the a &R guy initially, right? Um, if he thinks it's a hot deal in, in whatever genre, they want a piece of it. When you know you've got a chance of cutting the deal is when not one A&R turns up, but they all turn up. Because when one turns up, forget it, because he'll just go there and he's probably on expenses and he's got some bird around the corner he's going to shag afterwards, right? He don't really give a shit what you're doing. When they all turf up, you know you've got a deal. At that point, yeah, yeah. yeah probably is. Um, at that point, you should talk to a lawyer. When they all turn up at one of your gigs, right? Because you know they're going to come in and offer him, right? And that, uh, it's not based on numbers per se. It's based on the vibe of what's around it, right? You know, when Jesse J got a deal, everyone was after her. 
but she'd been around for a while. Look at Tiny. Tiny Templar got turned down by every label. In fact, the, one of Mr. Quern's over there was involved with uh, Cadiz. He looks after Cadiz and uh, Disturbing London. <coughs> and every major record label turned him down. As soon as he had a result with a one-album deal with EMI, everyone, if you'd have put a pair of glasses on, I could have got your deal. Everyone wanted black geese with glasses, right? <laughs> it's like Adele. Everyone wanted a fat bird. Right? That's how it is. And, and it, so, so, you know, it's a safety thing. It's, it, it, you know, at the end of the day, if you're sat in a, a major record label and you've got these budgets that you've got to be responsible for, whilst you can swan around and fart around and roll the expenses, it's all good. But at the end of the day, at some point, you've got to deliver. So they they're not going to chase you. You've got, to let, you've got to make it so you build a buzz, you build identity, you build profile so they want to come to you. Because if you invite them to a show, they don't come. You can do a showcase. You can do a showcase, you invite 100 people, they all say they're going to come. You get there, two people turn up. And that's usually the junior's junior's PA who wants a night out because she thinks she get a free beer. Right? And it, 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 it's the same and it doesn't matter how much you've got going on and that. You cannot get them out there. And, and if you're trying to get hold of them, like we go around the record labels all the time talking to them and it's like, you know, they give you the platitudes and they give you all the flannel and yeah, da, 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 and they never put a deal on the table because it's, it's when they need you really. So you've got to make them need you. If, you. if you've got everyone walking around in your shirt like Dench, people are going to want to talk to you. Like, what the fuck is this? Let's find that something about this geezer, right? Suddenly they'll be your friend. You'll be the hottest geezer around, right? But I, I would have said in, in, in those terms, if a limited budget, that's probably the best way for you to go. Which sounds corny because you're not a t-shirt seller, yeah, but... Yeah, yeah. That's the reality, right? Yeah. Snapbacks, you can bring snapbacks in for five quid, knock them out at 25, right? If the logo's great, the brand is great, you're great. Okay. Pleasure. Let's talk back to why I started these conversations, because I, I think that musicians need to think more in an entrepreneurial way, right? About, about business, about what are the basic pillars of a business. And I, I think that this is what London Fusion does, and it's, it's about business models, right? About setting up all the assets you have in a way that makes sense for the market. Right, so as, as Ian said, you, you might be selling music, but actually you make money selling t-shirts. So you need to go there, you need to invest more and, and see and explore what actually sells. Or about, about preparing like a, a proper business model. Can you explain a little bit? Um, yeah, I think sometimes it's about... Um, uh, we run business model workshops as part of London Fusion and we get a lot of musicians coming along sometimes. And there's always this confusion when you talk to them about a customer segment, who's your customer segment? And they'll say, I don't have customers, I'm an artist, whoever likes my music buys it. No, you have to break it down. Your customer segment might be someone who's publishing music for film. Another customer segment might be someone who's buying music. Another customer segment might be someone who licenses music to be played in Topshop and Topman. There are different segments and different markets different customer segments and you have to identify them differently. So to, to, to pick up on Tommy's point and um, Ian's point, um, if you do merchandising, you have to really look for your audience, your customer segment for that piece of merchandising and have a business model just for those products. And that might be separate from the music. Someone, people buying the t-shirts might not be the same people buying the music. And this is how you have to look at it. Everything you put out is a different, has a different customer segment and needs a different business model around it. And I think this is the reality that a lot of music companies and music businesses and musicians and artists have to get to grips with, that they are producing products and they have to find the customers for them and market directly to their, those customers, not just put it out and hope, because that doesn't work anymore. Definitely doesn't work in Europe. Kind of works in America if you're lucky, but even then you've got to do a bit of work behind that, I think. Question right here. Um, yeah, I just want to go back to um, saying about the traditional stuff like the print press and this. Just any kind of advice on mainly focusing on magazines and stuff actually to get yourself noticed by them because, like you said, I've read so many fucking articles that tell you put this in your press pack, put that in your press pack, and you try it and you don't hear back. I mean, anything that you really should definitely include, things that you should definitely not include because it's going to bore them. Do something um, to the package. In, or? in terms of, in terms of uh, just sending in a press pack blind anyway, they're going to ignore it anyway. Yeah, it'll just end up in the bin. That's the reality. Um, you, again, it's the same with all of it. You've got to give them a reason to want to look at your press pack. So it's not even what's in it. It's actually getting the first point is getting the fuckers to look at it. Right? Because they're getting, you've got, you've got to remember, everyone, every one of these magazines is getting thousands of these a day or a week. Right? 
Same with radio, they're getting bombarded with shit. It's even worse now because they all take MP3, so you're getting masses of it, right? So you need someone in there pitching it who knows the people, who knows, oh, they might go for that, yeah, I like them. That's when you start worrying about what's in it. Again, what's in it is the pertinent points. People don't want to read an essay, you know? I mean, we, sometimes I have to edit stuff for Joe that she gets in. Sometimes the majors send a three-page biogs to send out with records. It's like, no one's going to read that. What radio guy is going to sit there and go, oh, yeah. Oh, they were born eight years old. They lived in Brooklyn. <laughs> they moved down to Stratton Island. Who gives a shit? Is it a good record or not, right? So just stick to the pertinent points. Bullet point it. Because if they like it, they're going to find out more, right? And, and let your music speak. Yeah. But you, again, you've got to give them a reason to want to listen to it and to want to talk about you. You know, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you gigging? Are you doing this? I just had a great gig here. Try and get someone down there, maybe a junior, a guy working there. Get the junior down. And give it to them. Give, yeah, give them, a, give them a CD or whatever and, and give them some links and, and talk to them. Get them down there. You know, don't go for the editor. The editor don't give a toss. He's getting taken out by all the big boys. Go down the, go down the ladder. Then the kid's going to go into the office, the intern, and go, you know, oh, brilliant gig. This geezer's amazing. You know? Why go to the top? They don't care who you are. So try and look out for the people that you can spot them, maybe that are doing yeah, those, the, the lower the, runs. That you think could be into what you're doing and, and, and approach them. You know, look, I'm doing this gig, love to get you down here, you know, buy you a beer, you know, yada, yada, yada. It's a foot in the door. And once you've got a foot in the door, build on that. I, I certainly wouldn't get bogged down in worrying about what you actually put in the press pack because yeah. you could put anything or nothing in there and it would go in the bin anyway. So. Right, so, um, yeah, we're running out of time. It's been... Really interesting conversation. We've been running for two hours, normally one hour and a half. Cheers, Ian. So, to respond to him, I'm the person who just spoke. I'm about getting writers and stuff. Basically, I've done the whole press pack thing before and all that. As how he says it doesn't work, but what has worked kind of ongoing for me and the people I work with is kind of reconnect directly to the writers of the publication. So certain there's different writers for each online and offline, and kind of connect with them and kind of show that you know about their work and it gives them appreciation and stuff like that and they feel like, right, oh, this guy really, he feels what my struggle, you know? <laughs> and then um, they kind of take care to you, innit? Let me feel his struggle as well. So that's kind of worked there, yeah. right, So two quick questions. Um, so one. I think it's my Hello. fault. Um, I want to know what you think for emerging artists especially, uh, how important it is, because most emerging artists rule this out completely, but getting a PR company involved at an early stage. My point. What, um, okay, good, just checking. You, you mentioned Sandy Tom earlier. Um, I'm working with Pete, who broke Sandy Pete Tom. Bassett. Yeah, Pete yeah, I know Bassett. Pete very well, I Pete. Yeah, and I just, I'm, but I'm, I'm, I was sceptical at first PR, but, I just, but do you think for emerging artists they should completely rule out and just do everything themselves? Well, ultimately, so I'm, I'm PR, right? And so Fred Bloggs comes in. If there's anyone called Fred Bloggs, I apologise, it's not aimed at you. Um, Fred Bloggs comes in, who's done jack shit, right, has got a track. Who the fuck is going to write about it? Who gives a shit? It's, it's what I'm saying. You know, so I'm paying But they Pete. create stories, don't they, like, especially for yeah, but, people but that can help? As you know from Mr Bassett, he's a bit of a legend at doing stories, right? Yeah. Fantastic. He's great at what he does. There's only so many times that can work. There's only so many Chinese waitresses who have sold 10 million records in China. Because no one actually sits at media and goes, well, why is she working in the fucking Wing Fung Fu in Shoreditch if she sold a million fucking, you know. They don't actually, no one actually dissects it because they go, oh, yeah, that's a great story. We've got a bit of a gap. We've bung that in there, right? But the reality is if you're paying out your own pocket, they're not going to be able to get you anything. It's on the release. That's what I always say with the release. Every project I've ever had a PR person on, and I've got nothing against PR. They do a great job. But you've got to give them something to get PR, Right? So unless you've got a, unless you've I got was, a story, I was lucky enough because I manage an artist that won a competition out of eleven thousand bands, and that was the prize. But I'm still working with him now. But a band also, but that then you've got a story, right? Yeah. So whether anyone gives a shit, yeah. you don't know. But you've won a pro, you know, you won a competition. Great, right? But you know, you're you're competing for all those column inches. You're competing with the likes of James Arthur, right? Who, who's like manna from heaven for PR, right? Because one day he's homophobic, next day he's not homophobic, next day he doesn't know what fucking homophobia is. You know, uh, uh, you know, so he, he's like, he's the gift that keeps giving, right? You know, and it's the, he come out with the old classic line, you know, some of my best friends are gay. You know, it was like, really? But what is, the, what is the story you're giving to that magazine or that paper? You know, I've got a new act, they've got a record out. Okay, what, what have they done? Uh, fuck all, that's the first thing they've done. 
Well, is there any angles? You know, one of, is one of them shagging a, you know, shagging someone in Towie or something? You know, no. Oh, okay. You know, and that's gone on forever. I mean, when I, I when I was working at Boku, like, they asked me to get engaged to Kelly Marie because they were trying for a number one slot and it would have gotten press. And I'm like, she's a munter, right? There's no way my mates are going to rip me to pieces, right? But it's it's gone on forever. But it's, it's a story. It's PR, and, and you know. It's the same way, you know, when you're an X Factor, all they try and do with the X, every red top, I just had continuous calls from red tops where they dig into everything. They go through the family, they Google every single link to that artist and find out any dirt they can possibly find, right? Because it's a story. So you're going in with a band, you've paid a PR guy to go in and he goes in and goes, great record, they don't care what it sounds like. You know, write about this for me. Well, who's it going to appeal to? So there has to, if it's new, it's got to have a link. It's got to have something to give it traction. Whether you make it up or not, or, you know, whether you get engaged to Ryland, you know, whatever. I mean, <laughs> which will, probably would get you column inches. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was saying, that's, as I say, it's nothing against PR, but there's a time and a place for PR. And I think emerging artists just putting a track out as a first thing, you're not going to get any PR. If you start getting radio and start getting TV, say you've done a cheap video, get your video out there. I'd always recommend if you're actually going for a release, you do a video. You can get a great video done for 500 quid. The traction you can get on YouTube, it gives your plugger a lot more opportunities as well because they can turn around and go, look, there's the vid, it looks great, you know, whatever. I would always do that. I'd much rather pay to get a video done than I would to pay for PR at the initial stages. Isn't it probably more sensible for new artists, rather than focusing on all the social media, to focus on writing some good songs? Uh, well, that was the first thing in my thing, was that it's all about the song. <laughs> They focus on everything else apart from what they're supposed to do. I can't, critique, to I can't yeah. critique everyone's songs, but as I said at the start, yeah. it's all about the song. If you haven't got a song, you haven't got a project. Self-managed artists don't make it. Well, no, because they're not using professionals, so they don't know yeah. what to do. I mean, I totally agree. Or spend £1,500 a week on a PR. Yeah, it's getting nothing. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going there. Thank you. I just employed him. I'm not saying nothing. I love him. He's, he's a good lad. He's really good. What I was wondering about is whether sort of in your line of work or whether you're aware of situations where people like the managed people or that are involved in major labels ever fight for artists but not necessarily because they see a commercial value but because of their artistic merit. So whether you come across people where you think, I really, I, I really feel what they're doing. I'll, I, 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 I want personally, to I try and work with stuff that I enjoy. Right? <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't work with, you know, my thing isn't, like heavy rock, like John's a heavy rock guy, but it's not really my thing. So I'd, I'd have a real problem listening to it, because if they come and play me something new, I wouldn't have a fucking clue, in honesty, right? But you would obviously, yeah, you obviously want to try and work with stuff that you can make money out of, because you've got to monetize what you do. So as a manager or record label, you don't want to sign stuff just because, oh, I love this, I know it's not going to sell a copy, but it's fantastic. What, 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 Could you make that sell a copy, if you wanted to? Well, it depends what it is. Again, you come down to the the objectivity of what sort of music it is. If it's Albanian flute music played through <laughs> someone's arse and it sounds fantastic, you know, I'm going to go to Jules. Well, actually, Jules might show it, might he? Some Albanian flute player coming out playing out of his arse. I don't know, but you still probably wouldn't shift many. But it, it, obviously, it's dependent on the music. But yeah, I mean, the primary concern is that you can develop a pro Like Ed Sheeran's a good example. You know, if he come in, you've got some ginger kid who plays a guitar. Most people would have gone, fuck off, right? But he, he made some great records. He did, he got accepted by the urban community. They all got in there, so he got attraction going. Suddenly, everyone goes, oh, Ed Sheeran's amazing. A year before, he wouldn't get arrested. So some, whoever signed him, I don't even know off the top of my head who signed Ed. I can't remember who signed him. But, but yeah, they believe in it. You know, Pete and publishing, you know, he'll sign, an, he'll sign a songwriter or an artist because he believes in what they're doing. We all try and do that. I, I, I'm not, I, listen, if Gangnam Style came in and someone said, do you want to sign that? I'd sign it because I, I know I could turn some money on it. But in terms of working with it going forward, no, because, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. But as a one-off earning a bit of, a bit of cash, yeah, I'd, I'd have a go at that, you know. But primarily, I want to work with stuff that I enjoy. I mean, my personal thing, I'm, I'm a dance hall nut. Well, that, that doesn't sell, right? There's no outlets for it. You, you cut the special shows and one extra. That's it. But that's what I listen to at home, right? As my wife will testify, because she doesn't like it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I personally wouldn't go and sign dance hall. I'm... I'm I'm verging on an act at the moment that's kind of between the two stalls of, of R&B and dancehall, so that's an interesting one, so I might get involved in that. But yeah, I, I have to, personally, I have to be involved in stuff that I enjoy. I, I couldn't just sit there every day, you know, getting up and, and doing what you do and run around and 
make all the calls and talk to agents if you didn't believe in it. You know, and, and that's what I said about majors. You know, yeah, sure, they, they sign some shit acts. But they sign them because they've got to pay the bills. But they'll also, you, you know, you've got to give it to the a guys. A lot of guys, a lot of acts that are signed aren't overtly commercial to start with. And they do spend time and energy. And that's, that's where the problem arises with the act, is if the a and guy who's the believer gets the elbow or moves on. And then they're stuck with a five-album deal or whatever. If the advances for the next album aren't too high, they're going to stay for the second, they're going to pick up the option, they're not going to drop them. And then he's stuck with someone who might not even like him. So that's the downside of it. But yeah, you, you, you can't, you know, you, you've got to try and work with stuff that you think long-term will make you money, or short-term, you can cash in quick and, and, and earn your buck. I, I would always personally try and work with stuff I enjoy personally. And I think most people in the industry are the same. You, you, you're not going to just sign stuff, you know, keep, you know. I mean, you've got, you got companies that just deal with boy bands, like production companies and stuff. They just develop boy bands and girl bands and stuff. Well, to me, that, you know, I'd rather go and work in, you know, Sainsbury's or something, to be honest. I mean, but it doesn't mean it's not a valid thing. It's just personally, I wouldn't do it. Universal background, as Ian's mentioned a few times, and I work really hard, and the people I work with work really hard on bands that we not necessarily like. You know, we kind of we don't we don't A and R it, we don't sign the bands. We're in the sales and distribution business, so we actually have to work what we're given. And every day we're working on bands that we may not like, but at the end of the day we have to deliver on those bands because we've got an involvement with the manager, with the artist more often than not. We Sometimes we get involved in track decisions, or we get asked about marketing, you know, all kinds of elements to it. And for us it's kind of, you can't love everything, I can't love everything I work. I work probably 30 releases a week, 30 new releases a week, and I probably love two of those releases. Are they both mine? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but every week my task is to deliver those products to retail. You know, whether it's iTunes, Spotify, you know, Vivo, whoever you're talking <coughs> about, that's my job to do that. You know, and I work long hours, as do most of the people in majors, and I know the man over there is not a big fan of majors, but you know, the people who work in majors now work hard, work long hours, and they want to deliver their products. You know, we, we don't get to choose what products we work, unfortunately. But, you know, for anybody that's in a major at the moment, and there's not many left these days, um, you know, they're kind of people who are passionate about, just as passionate as you guys are here, and will more often work harder on a project than the band will. Yeah. You know, that, you know, that's... And if you look at it, and you know the song, you got to do your job. The bonuses, yeah, the bonuses is when you work yeah, stuff you do love. So yeah, that's the bonuses. You've, you've still got, got to do you've it. You've got a million people out there that walk into your job tomorrow. There's a million people out there that walk in to do my job tomorrow. If I don't deliver, I'll be out. You know, end of story. You know, if you don't do it, if you don't write a great song, does it matter? You can just go and write another song. You know, we're judged every single week on what we deliver on by management, by artists, by promo teams, everybody. If we don't deliver on that, we're out. It's as simple as that. You know, and like I say, there's, the people in this room would all, you know, love to walk into a major tomorrow, I'm sure. You know, and so believing that people in majors don't care is a real fallacy. It, it's, it's not true at all. Those people care. We work long, long hours, as long as most people. And if anything, I would say... A band, the first thing for me, without, obviously the song is, you know, is absolutely critical, but actually working hard, and not just for four, five, six weeks, you have to work hard every single day for years to get to where you're going to be. And those bands that do that succeed. The bands who give in after a few months are the bands, you know, you're never going to make it. Well, the, the biggest band you've been working recently, who've, who've, how long they've been at it for I mean, years? Yeah, 1975. 1975, Warren been working with together. those guys, you know? You know, been around for years, you know, but they changed the, they've changed the name three times, you know. But that band have always toured. They're going to tour this year. They're going to play 300 gigs, you know. That, you know, and when you put that kind of commitment into something, you're going to succeed, you know. And it's all about how hard the band works. And more often than not, we see bands that are just really lazy, really lazy, you know. And so if you work hard enough and you believe in it enough, you, you know, the lady there who was saying, you know, you've got to believe in what you do. You have to, because when I go into retail, I've got to be banging the desk going, this 1975 record, you know, 
Chocolate, nobody had heard of Chocolate when I took that into retail. The 1975 single was their biggest single. Nobody had heard of that single. And you have to bang your fist and you say, this record is going to be fucking great. It's going to be amazing. You've got to take this. You've got to profile this. You've got to put a banner up, you know, on your site, on iTunes. You have to believe in it. And the same as you have to believe in yourself, you know. And you have to put that over every time you go out. When you're talking about it, you have to be the best thing you are. You know, you're, every time it's like, I'm great at what I do, and this is fucking great. You need to listen to it. You know, you have to have that. There is the perseverance. There is so many people in this industry, you know, trying to get to that position. You just have to be better than them. You have to want it more than them. And that's all I would say. There's a famous Gary Player quote, the golfer. He said, "Um, the more I practice, the luckier I get. (laughs) And that that is it. You know, that's, that's, you know, I was telling Tommy the other day about it. You know, that, that that is the reality, you know. Right. Okay, so I think we'll just drag the conversation as much as we can. And I would like to, to thank everybody for being here. For basically, Ian, please a round of applause for yeah. Ian. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really great. Obviously, there is beer later. So if you want to catch up with Ian, you're not going home. You're going to stay here. You're going to talk with these people. <laughs> right. So I hope you liked what happened today. Uh, this happens once a month, beginning of every month. So if you're interested in that, just Docker mu- Music Talks. Is, this is everywhere. Website, social media. Talk about it with this hashtag. And we'll, I'll send you an email with the presentation today in case you want to see what's written on it or in case you were paying attention to all the fuck shit things he was talking about. <laughs> Um, we'll stay in touch. Uh, every month I'm trying to bring musicians to talk as well, <coughs> to tell their aspect, right? So, their little stories, everything, you know, probably this is a platform for musicians to start talking to people and then listen to them, right? The personal stories as well. So, this month we have uh, Nate, who uh, is a really great guy, but he's going to tell us a few things about what he believes in certain stuff. It's, it's all on you. Thank you. And I'm going to speak for about... Uh, less than five minutes because we've been sitting here for a really long time and it's been super interesting and amazing and I don't think I have a tenth of the value to offer in terms of actual practical things to do but I am a romantic. I'm an absolute romantic. So all I I wanted to talk about is is sustainability because I believe that business and sustainability have to go hand in hand for us to survive literally as a race at this point. Um, So within for myself as a musician and as an artist and as a speaker and as a voice I consider myself a folk musician, a voice for the people. I I really... that is a focus for me. But what I realized sitting here and listening and thinking like, what could I say in just a few minutes? And it is that music as a catalyst for change. The reason that I love lyrics and that I love music and have my whole life is because it changed the way I thought about the world. It gave me inspiration and it gave me hope and it, ga- it, it, it gave me something to associate my emotions with. And I think that all I'd like to finish today with, because you guys have all spoken so beautifully, is just to say that we can actually change the world and, and have a better vision of it and that I want to be a part of that. And I think that this is a part of that is taking responsibility for ourselves as musicians, as business people, and doing that in a sustainable and responsible way. So thank you all so much. That was awesome. (laughs) Great. So that was it for this month. I think that's more than enough value for people to think for for the next month to come. (laughs) Uh, I will give you all the contact details of Ian so you can spam him anytime. He will wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning to answer every tweet. Actually, I test him. He answers on every tweet of mine within 10 minutes. So you can test him as well. I highly recommend. And that was it. For, for me, a round of applause from, from me to you. So thanks for being here.